Did you watch Silverstone this weekend? No, I didn't actually. I I've missed the last two races. This whole like uh, planning a wedding vow renewal thing has really put a wrench in my F1 watching. I mean, we don't have the uh, we don't have YouTube TV, but we were at our friend's house at our and friends who were meeting us wound up showing up like at lap fifty two. It was nice. great. First half I was slow on. I was stoked that Lewis took third. And McLaren is uh yeah. getting it together. Yeah. That Daniel Ricardo's back as of like an hour ago. I know. That's exciting. I like him a lot. Yeah. It's always fun to have him around. Um It'll be exciting to see. I mean, who knows what that car can actually do, um, considering I think they have like two points on the year. Yeah. Uh, you know, it can only get better. It can only get better. A great segue. So today, Chris is here to talk with me about the first Ford Model A being sold. On July 23rd, 1903, the first Ford Model A was sold. Uh, it was sold to a man named Ernest Fenning, who was a dentist in Chicago. I find it crazy that the first one wasn't sold in Detroit, but it was the first car produced by the Ford Motor Company and sold for $850, which is about $29,000 today. They produced 1,750 Model A cars between 1903 and 1904 out of a rented facility in Detroit. I also want to clarify that they're like there are two different Model A's. So this was the very first one. There was another model that came out in like 1927, 28 after the Model T, which I didn't know. I realized that in the course of researching this. So the Model A was equipped with a horizontal mounted flat two engine that was capable of producing eight mighty horsepower. It could hit top speeds of around 30 miles per hour, which honestly, I'm looking at the design of it, it was terrifying <laughs> to go 30 miles an hour in that. There was like a picture of the braking system on Wikipedia and it was like, oh no. My golf cart gets a little squirrely at 25. So uh, a Model A at 30. <laughs> uh, it did have different trim levels. So like right off the bat, they were like, we're going to customize this for you. Uh, you could get two or four doors. You'd have a tonneau cover. Uh, you could opt for a rear door. That wasn't standard. And you could get either a rubber or a leather roof. Two years later, it was replaced in 1904 by the Model C, which had like a brief overlap, and they made the AC, which as Abby Charles, I guess that has to be my favorite model. It basically was just the Model A with like a 10 horsepower engine. They had spent almost their entire $28,000 investment, which is like $911,000 today, uh, building and promoting the Model A when the first one was sold. They had something ridiculous like $280 left in their, in their bank account. This would prove to be a pivotal moment for Henry Ford, as his previous two attempts at starting motor vehicle companies failed. The Model A's relatively low cost helped popularize the use of vehicles for the middle class and set the stage for manufacturing with interchangeable parts, which eventually led to the development of the assembly line, which I think is the other thing that he's maybe even more well well known for. Today, Ford Motor Company is the sixth largest producer of cars in the world, and its F-Series trucks dominate. In the American truck market. That's an yeah, understatement. Like driver, Especially yeah. here in the South. Yeah. Yep. And expensive yeah. trucks abound. Uh, so I have a really unique relationship to this one that I don't think you know. You, I know you don't know about because no one really does. Okay. So my wife's great, great grand uncle um so my her dad's great grand great 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 grandfather's uncle was alexander young malcolmson who is the guy that made that twenty eight thousand dollar investment in the ford motor company to begin with there was this turning point that happened really like at the inflection point for the ford motor company which was when they decided if they wanted to go down the, um, you know, what would become now the like Ford F-150 route, which is like inexpensive, like mass-produced vehicles, uh, which is what Henry Ford wanted to do. 
Malcolmson wanted to explore the, I think it was the Model T and, or not the Model T, I forget exactly which model it was, um, the Model K. He wanted to go like down the Model K route and make luxury vehicles as a way to grow profits in the company. Because at the point that they were at, they were making money and paying dividends on their original investments. And like, and Malcolmson oh. had something like 25% in the company. Uh, so Ford did some kind of shady maneuvering. Um, uh, he's not a like great dude, like all around. He like, Henry Ford? Isn't... yeah. Uh, no, no, we're not. <laughs> uh, we'll the person. Uh, uh, but he, he made some maneuvering and made a um uh, essentially like a parts company that would manufacture all of the parts to uh make the the model a and in doing so was able to shift all the profits for the company uh to the manufacturing company which uh malcolmson wasn't part of forcing malcolmson to sell his shares for like one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars um, so her side of the family did, is not Ford money, um, or else we probably wouldn't be married. Let's be honest. Um, you know, it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be this guy, but yeah, uh, uh, they were there at the beginning of the, uh, of the Ford motor company. That's super interesting. I think, I think probably like a large part of what has made Ford so successful was that they were geared towards you know, like affordable cars that everyone could drive and they did their best to build them with like, I don't know if necessarily like the, the best parts and products, but like that built Ford and South motto that they've always had was like, a, that was an original marketing tactic that they used with the, with the Model A. Despite the fact that they still had a whole bunch of problems with them, but they were problems that were like common to all the other, all the other car companies of the day. But there were, um, I think Chrysler was already producing vehicles at the same time, uh, but they were a luxury. They were geared more towards that market. And I think that that was a smart business opportunity, maybe not done in the most uh, affable way. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, it's what made the company, right? And that, yeah. uh, I, like, I think, as you mentioned, my father is a mechanical engineer and this, uh, he was with General Motors for uh, 30 something years. Now he works for uh, a startup and an electric vehicle startup in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think that the, the, the biggest contribution that, that the model a and that Ford made was the, the assembly line, right? The, the really like the standardization of how vehicles are going to be made and that that assembly line model went on to be improved over the years with like Toyota right. Kaizen and like you know there's a huge huge um, growth from it but it's really responsible for uh, vehicles the I, I think the the structure of society right and how how cities are built today when you look at the power the automotive industry has in this not even in just this country in the world it's kind of mind-boggling and that has all yeah. happened as the vehicles have been made so accessible if they've been made indispensable especially as you look at you know i can't remember exactly what the history was behind it but like la used to have an incredible uh subway and train system and the automotive lobby kind of came in and destroyed that. I'm probably just talking out of, talking out of nowhere right now, but it was like LA used to be a very walkable, traversable city without the use of a car, and now yeah. there's nothing there's nothing that will qualify LA as walkable. You have to use a car yeah. to get all the way across town and it takes hours to do anything. And that's happened in a lot of cities. Yeah. Unrelated to preparing for this, but there's a movement to connect right. Wilmington and Raleigh 
like Raleigh Durham to the rest of the like northeastern corridor mm-hmm. and to put a like, high speed rail line in. And all of that is is really exciting. Um and is somewhere that we like really lag behind as a as a country. But a lot of that can go back to is directly traced back to the the auto lobby and the the push for cities designed for vehicles for um, buses as a, a form of mass transportation as opposed to uh, to rail uh, and you know I think we're getting to the point that we realized that 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 was ultimately it. Yeah, I think there's room for both, um, but it's exciting to see now. But also, you know, it, having lived in Detroit for a while, um, I graduated from high school in uh, Detroit. Um, you know, it's still an automotive city, for better or worse. Yeah. My uncle has lived in Detroit. Well, I mean, not his whole life, but my, uh, my family grew up in Michigan. My um one of my uncles used to work for GM. My family lived right next to the proving grounds, which was really cool. You could go sit by them and kind of like see new concept cars driving by on the proving grounds. It's cool. My uncle's been a mechanic and body, like auto body worker for as long as I've been alive in Detroit. Like it's really the lifeblood of that city. And it's still like the focus is moving away from that. I think. Or not, maybe not moving away, but becoming more inclusive of other things that make a city great besides just the vehicles. Boy, Kristen's uncle uh, and uncle live right next to the proving grounds now. Um, they're friend? like family. They like owned a bunch of land. Up, this, the Malcolmson side of the family, um, uh, owned a bunch of land out there. And now like they've kind of subdivided some of it like amongst the family and some of it is sold off, but it's like basically across the street. Uh, yeah from the proving grounds so it's it's nice out there i mean michigan's a really interesting state it's like it's the if you look at all of the states in the country and uh percentage wise the number of people that were born in the state that still live there uh michigan ranks the highest uh, uh really yeah of uh, residents that never leave the state uh interesting so it's a very unique, specific feeling to Michigan. Uh, All of that. My younger sister lives now in the city where I was born, which is in Michigan, in Traverse City. I mean, that's the good side of the state. Like, you know, and this is total, like, bias for me because I, you know, I told Chris that I've moved out of the Midwest three times and I don't intend on doing it again. No. Um, <laughs> you just have to say out loud. Uh, but the the west side of the state is 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 really beautiful and it yeah you know everybody talks about like michigan summers and they really are amazing like yeah it's a really magical time to be there but part of the reason it's magical is because the rest of the season so bad but yeah you know, uh the west side of the state is really great my parents bought a house on all lake when my dad retired and he was really excited to move back to michigan because that's where him and i were both born um, and my stepmother grew up in Hawaii. I think they lasted about three winters before my stepmom was like, <laughs> absolutely not. Like, it's nice here three months of the year. She doesn't yeah. really drive. So she was like, this isn't enjoyable to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, Michigan. Wow, we got off topic. Does your, does your family but live in? Is there property in Milford? It's right outside of Milford, yeah. I think technically their address is Milford, uh, but they're out in the country. It's what a weird beautiful. place to have a joint connection to Milford, Michigan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The original Henry Ford Motor Company plant was in Highland Park, uh, and the original Model A, Model was Model A or Model T was built in Dearborn at the Rouge River facility. But the original Highland Park one, where the first assembly line was, was, uh, and I think that was the Model T. It's yeah. a little rough around there. That facility has like fallen into disrepair. <laughs> and I don't like, yeah, I lived in, in 
Detroit for a while. And like in high school, you see what I'm shows downtown and like I've lived got- in Brooklyn for a long time and like worked in some neighborhoods that like were certainly not gentrified. And like, I know how to like take care of myself and like, I generally don't feel unsafe. Uh, around the Highland Park Bridge, I did not necessarily feel the most safe. This I'll, isn't a admit. nighttime walk by yourself spot. No, no, definitely not. But it is when you're there, there is a very distinct feel of this is a building that like something, something world changing happened in. Like it does. It's it's kind of sad to see it in the state that it is in now because it is such a, a, a an important. Place. Have you been to the NASCAR museum yet in Charlotte? No. Yeah, we found out about that kind of like as we were, um, when we were out here looking for houses, we stopped at a brewery and someone asked if we were going. We, about. we are now. We are now. Uh, we didn't wind up making it because we had to catch our flight, but it's, it's, I think it's super interesting that North Carolina is such a hotbed for racing. Um, hey, Haas F1 has, uh, uh, some headquarters here really yeah well gene haas all of his uh like teams are based outside of charlotte so the the f1 contingent and uh what's his name lives in um uh in the u.s in north carolina primarily um gunter gunter steiner Um, oh really so maybe you can run around get your stuff run into gunter steiner somewhere around north carolina I think at, at one point, the only uh, NASCAR team that wasn't located in North Carolina was in Denver. Oh, that's right. I remember that. I don't think they survived long. We did go by the uh, Watkins Glen course when we were out there. Yeah. That looked pretty cool. There were a bunch of Porsches doing testing. So there's a, I always find this interesting that around uh, the New River Gorge area in West Virginia, uh, the way also Henry Ford back in the day in an effort to cut costs in manufacturing um, wanted to control every bit of the supply chain. So uh, coal was an important part of, of powering uh, the manufacturing facilities. So he purchased a bunch of land uh, in the New River Gorge and was mining coal around West Virginia and I think it's Nuttleburg. The issue was the rail lines transporting the coal to Detroit because he didn't own that portion of it. Um, so he ended up shutting them down and they've kind of fallen into disrepair, but they still exist. You can go hiking around the near river gorge and see these big like coal chutes that uh, are coal conveyors that are from uh, Henry Ford back in the day. Oh, very cool. Uh, yeah, West Virginia, the whole country up there. Um, driving through that, I was pretty. It's hard to make the connection. Like, you know, obviously you have to have mountains to mine coal from. Um, but seeing the mountains in West Virginia, and... yeah, that would be. You need to get you need to get your rail on lock because this... there's yeah. a lot of hill, a lot of land to traverse. So they could have just loaded up. Could he not figure out how to build a truck for that? It's interesting to like think about in relation to each other. Yeah. The like auto baron that is Henry Ford and the coal barons and the rail barons back in the day. And Henry Ford, who we think of as, yeah, I mean, especially like around Detroit still, there's the like hospitals are Henry Ford. There are like, Muse, uh, museums and buildings all over the place that are Henry Ford. It's like, you know, not quite like Rockefeller, but not that far off. Um, he couldn't afford to buy the rail lines. So, to like put it into perspective, the amount of wealth that was in the rail lines uh, is very dwarf. Uh, dwarf to Henry Ford. Yeah. 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 Apropos of nothing, I was also, as part of this, I looked up what the uh, what the fastest production cars are now and in that realize that the fastest production car that a person can purchase is faster than an F1 car it was the Lucid Lucid yeah 
of the specific Lucid Air Sapphire, the 1200 horsepower three electric engine uh, sedan with limousine style seating in the back. <laughs> Retails for a cool 250. That's not bad. That's not bad for zero to 104 seconds and you still sit in the back like you're in like a Maybach. Like that's pretty sweet. Yeah. But then does somebody have to drive it for you? Like if I'm spending 250 on a car, I'm I'm in the driver's seat. I I also found it really interesting that like the the top four cars or the four fastest production vehicles right now are all either electric or hybrid. Uh, Which I mean, it, it which makes sense. Uh, that's part of the beauty of electric vehicles is instantaneous torque uh, which is very exciting uh, I mean for but a long time one of... thing, like how much how much uh, how much battery weight do you have to take into account to not interfere with the power that that's creating I mean the the electric Hummer is an example it seems like it would be ridiculously overpowered, but it's a 9,000 pound curb weight vehicle. God, that's heavy. It still isn't very fun to drive. Nope, I'm now car for a, a GTI. And it's one of the last years I think that they would make, they're, they're going to start switching everything over to either a uh, hybrid or yeah. full electric. And you can still get one with a six speed manual. My dream car for a long time was. A maybe still actually like have a kid and like get a Cadillac CTSV wagon manual. That'd be uh, like you know I just want the car. like. It is insane, insane. He doesn't yeah. have the wagon. He has the the two furs on the sedan. I guess. Um, yeah, insane right fast. My friend's mom got one and totaled it in three days. <laughs> so, you know, a car beyond the, the ability. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. this isn't that bad. the uh, The Hummer EV uh, makes a thousand horsepower, zero to sixty in three point three. Okay. For a Not nine thousand pound vehicle, what that seems dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Like you shouldn't be able to move that amount of mass that quickly. I'd like to see what the uh, I didn't look up the the base weight of an F one car, but those average just over a thousand horsepower. I'm sure they're uh, ridiculously light, which makes them that maneuverable. The minimum weight is seventeen fifty nine. Minimum, so they they're probably all seventeen sixty five. Yeah, exactly. I mean, especially this year with all of the cars, you noticed everybody has gone to a lot more black in the design to uh, yeah, cut down on decals and just raw carbon. Raw carbon looks great. Shaving grams. Shaving ground. Someone tell Henry Ford. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, you're you Henry go. Ford. This is what you started. I think it's a good place to wrap up. <laughs> I've, I'm sure we could sit here and talk about racing all day. And that. Very few people will want to continue listening to that. We'll take that off. On the closing note, did you watch the NASCAR race in Chicago? No. It was the the Grant Park in downtown Chicago. It was like street course on a uh, in the rain. <laughs> what? And the the guy that won it was a Kiwi. That um, it was his first NASCAR race ever. He's a like fantastic driver. In the like the uh, New Zealand Australia series, you like it's gonna go. Yeah, yeah. It was entertaining. It was a disaster, but it was entertaining. Who knows what the good race crash? As long as no one dies. <laughs> yeah, they were all low speed, so it was fine. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Frontier Podcast, powered by Gun.io. We drop two episodes per week, so if you like this episode. Be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and come hang out with us again next week and bring all your internet friends. If you have questions or recommendations, just shoot us a Twitter DM at the Frontier Pod and we'll see you next week.